All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, this is our uh, Coffee Clotch event presented by Perkins Cooey. Um, my name is Matt Gilkerson. I'm the program manager of Trailhead. I'm really excited to um, have everyone here today. Today, we're going to be talking about founder ownership, um, answering questions like, how do I divide up the pie? Should all founders have equal ownership and rights? And then um, diving into how you avoid the 10% issue. And I'm kind of interested to learn more about that. Um, I want to welcome uh, TM Rostegar, the uh, executive director of Trailhead to the call this morning, um, as well as um, I mentioned Derek. Um, Derek is a counsel at Perkins Cooey and advises startups and emerging growth and privately held companies and venture capital funds on equity and debt financing and other corporate transactions. Um, Derek is a uh, a, a great guy and he's been on this this uh hosting this you call. are a great guy Derek. thanks, thanks <laughs> you <Matt>. are. <laughs> yeah it never hurts to you know ad lib a little um well we never tell him that in the office so it's it's good that he hears it somewhere <laughs> I, I don't typically include that in my bio either i just try to tell truthful statements in my bio so thanks well, Matt. Is, appreciate this, that this well, is you, you know Derek, when somebody so has it is. Absolutely. It's, it's well, when somebody uh, has it in their bio you have to kind of go <laughs> You got to tell people you're honest. <laughs> I, I added that in my notes, just so y'all know. <laughs> the the, uh, the honestlawyer.com, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, and, and I want to introduce Melanie as well. Um, um, Melanie is uh, on our board of directors at Trailhead. And so I know, I know her through that, but she's also the managing partner of the Boise Perkins Cooey office um, and helps with the business, pra the business practice group for the Boise office through Perkins Cooey. Um, having a foundation in finance and entrepreneurial studies from the Wharton School of Business. Uh, she brings a business sensibility and reasonableness to her counsel through the arc of company growth from inception, inception to exit. And is also- Say that three well, times really fast, Matt. <laughs> inception to exit. And also, uh, I think great is an understatement for both of y'all. So um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the, uh, the presentation here and um, get started. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. Of course. So this is welcome. Welcome to this event. Uh, those of you who are returning, it's great to have you back with us. Those of you who are new, uh, welcome. We hope you'll enjoy this one and, and join us in the future. This this is totally meant to be um, an informal event. So we've taken some issues in advance. We have a few things we'll talk about. Uh, but for those of you on the call, just please feel free to unmute, to you know, post a question in the chat, raise your hand, yell, whatever you need to do to get our attention. We're happy to stop and, and just answer questions. This you know, hopefully will be an in-person event soon and we'll just be sitting around in a room and, and having these conversations. With and our coffee. With, <laughs> that's right, with your drink of choice. Or drink you, of choice, whatever, whatever it is. you start Water. the morning with. Yeah, juice. <laughs> So um, again, this is, we're glad to have you. We appreciate Trailhead. They're an amazing resource in the community and this is, it's just great to have this opportunity. So thank you. Um, we just, so for this topic today, founder ownership comes up a lot. Um, we uh, work as was introduced, we work with startups an awful lot in the community. Um, a lot of times from inception, from the beginning as Melanie's bio mentions, um, other times we you know, get brought in midstream, perhaps when there are problems <laughs> with uh, founder ownership and issues that arise with that. And so uh, we felt like this would be a good topic uh, to just discuss and, and answer some questions uh, this morning for you all. So to start out, um, Matt, if you wanna change the slide, there you go, next one. So we just have a question of, you know, how, how do I divide up the pie, right? So uh, many founders have this question as they come together and they're trying to decide what ownership, you know, looks like for a company. And we have, you know, a few questions here um, on the slide that we'll address. But just in general, you know, how do founders divide up ownership, right? Should it be equal? Should it not be equal? Um, you know, what are some issues that arise, you know, in that aspect? And so I think from just, you know, a, a purely business standpoint, right, this really isn't even a, a legal point necessarily, um, but ownership um, in a company really takes 
understanding who it is you're partnering with, right? Who are you founding with? What are, what are their skill sets that they're bringing to the table? What are the skill sets and experience you're bringing to the table? And ultimately, what are you going to contribute, right? And so in some cases, maybe that does look like a 50-50 split. Um, in other cases, though, maybe it's not. Perhaps someone's quitting their job and needing to take some salary in the beginning while you know the other founder is going to continue working their own job and a, you know not be taking any salary um, you know th those types of um, circumstances and details whatever the case may be you know, is going to dictate how you negotiate and decide how to divide you know that potential ownership if you do choose 50-50 ownership um, you know there's <laughs> which we don't advise. There, there are no <laughs> merger of equals. <laughs> there, it's important that you, know, you safeguard for, for future events, right? That could cause issues. So Melanie, you have you know, a few years of experience um, and a number of clients that you've worked with who've dealt with this issue. What are some of the things that you've seen that have come up you know, in having the 50-50 split? Derek, it's a really great question, um, and 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 there's there's a there's a lot of different things, and you've seen a number of them too. So you know if there's if there's some interesting ones that I kind of forget, but I think the biggest one is is related to what you've already said. Um, you know, imagine, and, and this is this is always where it's hard to be on Zoom because you know it's fun to look into the audience and see everyone's eyes because they start nodding when we say things like this. But like, you know, who amongst us hasn't been on a project? Like, think back to high school or grade school, right? And you got stuck on this team of three, five people, like whatever it was, and there was always the person who did or thought they did all the work, and then there's always the person who prided themselves on doing jack crap <laughs> you know and then there's the other people right the, the busy bees the, the people who are you know great to have on the team but you know maybe aren't the leaders maybe aren't the thought leaders or you know whatever but you know but they're getting the job done you know they're 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 getting the job done and and so you know as derek said you need to be thoughtful um you know when you're creating this group like if there's two of you you know the natural inclination is to say oh 50 50 we're all contributing equally you know if there's three it's a third a third a third and we see this all the time and then over time it chafes at people you know what i mean over time it starts to chafe and there's always someone who doesn't stick around there's always someone who's doing twice as much work and so i think derek you know, one thing to be thinking about is, um, is the allocation accurately reflecting the contributions, which is often difficult to ascertain because you're looking into a crystal ball sometimes. And so, which leads to the next problem, which is when you're looking into the crystal ball and prognosticating on what you think everyone's contributions are going to be, did you put in place the right safeguards for when they don't meet those metrics? You know what I'm saying? When you have the one person who does gut it out, you know, for a year and you have the other person who, who knows, maybe life circumstances, they had a death in the family, they got sick, like they couldn't pay their mortgage anymore. Like things happen, right? Like life gets in the way sometimes. So do you have the proper, like, not only did you set it up today the right way? And, and by the way, we'll talk about shareholder agreements. We, that's one of our topics down the road, which not that we can't touch on it now, but, you know, stay tuned, come back for that one. But do you have the right roadmap in place for if things don't quite work out the way you wanted them to? So that's one thing to deal with. Um, is, is just making sure things are copacetic with people's actual alloca allocations. Um, the other thing that we often see um, is, okay, great, you're all equal partners, but somebody's, you know, it's like Highlander, right? There can only be one, like somebody has to be the boss. You know what I mean? Somebody has to be the person who's like, you know, the, the buck stops with. I mean, it's not that you can't like consensus build or have committees or whatnot, but, but ultimately at the end of the day, there has to be some kind of deadlock, some kind of, you know, mechanism to break up, or I'm sorry, not deadlock, but break up the deadlock, you know, something to, to do that. And often when, you know, Derek, to your point with the 50-50, like what happens if you disagree? Do you just do nothing? Like inaction ends up being, you know, what, uh, um, what happens. And so, you know, it's not just ownership, but what does that ownership mean? Because often ownership translate in the absence of a different mechanism, ownership translates into your percentage of authority, right? In, in a company, if you kind of simply, you know, think of it that way. Um, a third thing 
that Derek and I encounter a lot to think about is people contribute different things, like literally different things. Like somebody might contribute money, you know what I mean? Somebody else. So let's imagine a scenario where Derek and I go into business together and, you know, Derek's got his big silk purse. So he's just going to put money in, you know? So he's like, I'm going to contribute, you know, I'll make up a number, a hundred thousand dollars. He's going to contribute a hundred thousand dollars. That's going to get us going. We're going to do 50, 50. Um, what people don't realize is um, if, if, I get 50% ownership and Derek gets 50% ownership and he contributed money and I'm contributing services. Another thing that we see happen a lot with companies is people get this ownership for services, but they don't realize that's taxable. And so we often, when we're, you know, splitting up the founder pie, people aren't always sensitive to that. You know, we call it the price is right problem. Um, you know, the people who go on the game show and get a truck or, you know, there was a scenario in Idaho, some of you who, who've actually been around for a few years might remember when they came and built the house for the couple and, you know, they got a like million dollar tax bill because the house was, you know, maybe not a million, but it was a few hundred thousand dollars, right? And so it, like, they were like, destitute. <laughs> they got this beautiful house and then they had a tax bill that they couldn't afford, right? And they ended up having to sell. Anyways, so, so what people don't realize is that when somebody gives you something, whether it's cash or whatever, it could be taxable. So that's another thing we often have to navigate, which isn't about the 50-50, um, you know, there's different aspects of it. There's, is everyone really equal in ownership? And then there are are we properly remunerating people for what their contributions are? Yeah. Yeah, no, and that, that, that's a great point. I think some of the things we've seen too, you know, once, once a company is founded, right, and you've kind of split up this ownership, perhaps there's still capital that's needed early on. And sometimes we'll see an instance where, you know, one of the founders is just pumping in cash, right? For the, for the company, it's, that's the resource they have, that's what they're contributing but there's nothing being given in return, right? Is it, is it debt that the company's gonna pay back? Is it additional equity where that you know, owner's share should actually be you know, going up as they're contributing capital? And so it, 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 it's not just an issue right at the beginning, right? As we decide how it's gonna be split, but also as you're you know, be in those beginning phases, especially in trying to just keep the company afloat making sure that that's, you know, accurately recorded and, you know, the, the ownership is appropriately yeah. <laughs> reallocated. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's also an issue that, you know, we've seen come up with. Well, and Derek, you make a, you make a really, you make a really good point that I hope you don't mind if I pull the thread on it a little bit, but if somebody contributes money to your company, it's one of three things, right? Like it can only be three things, you know, it's, it's, it's equity, it's debt, or it's a gift. Now I'm gonna go with, we could take the third one off the table because very few people are giving gifts to commercial enterprises, right? Like, I mean, it could happen, um, but if it's a gift, like yay you and yay them and you know, their, their benevolence. Um, but if it's debt or equity, it's really, really important to paper that contribution. And to, you know, to your point, Derek, um, you know, if you and I start off as 50, 50 owners, right? You gave your hundred thousand, I'm, I'm working. Um, and you know, well, how much work do I give for that 50? Right. And if you keep pumping money in, like, is it always equal? You know what I mean? Like, is my work right. level always equal to your cash level? Um, you know, I mean, maybe, but I mean, that's a presumption, but over time that'll start to chafe, right? Like you'll yep. start being like, I've now pumped in 300,000 and you're still just working, right? Like, you know what I mean? And, you know, by the way, why do I have to keep pumping money in when you're working? You know what I mean? Like, like these, these are the conversations that start to happen, right? Like, you know, and then I'm like, oh, I'm doing all the work. You're just putting the money in and, you know, this yep. is, this is how it rolls. So you have to think through not just that moment, the first moment, but what does it mean, you know, over the, um, maybe not life of the company, but, you know, the relationship going forward. Yeah, absolutely. 
TM, I see that you have your hand raised. Oh, very yeah. oh, look at that. I can't even see everyone's head. I should probably stick it on like grid screen or something. So <laughs> Matt, if we're missing anyone with their hand up, let us know. Yeah, I'll definitely jump in. No, no, De Derek caught it right away. I considered shouting. Derek did mention shouting is an option. Hand, you're you're yeah. welcome to shout. You're welcome I to shout. I, I start, I'll start slowly. I may, I may end up shouting in the end. Um, I, all jokes aside though, this is a real coffee clutch. I think uh, the, the references silver purse and price is right. Uh, this is a real coffee clutch. I love it. So a couple things. First, a, a, a statement and realization that's been bubbling up here is that it's just interesting how much of this topic overlaps, you know, the commercial side of a business, the legal side of a business, and also sort of the decision-making side. And so as I talk to founders who are asking me these questions and are struggling with defining some of these, you know, how much is the skill worth in terms, you know, if we were to monetize it in ownership or how much, how much is this contribution worth? You're making a sacrifice over here, I'm making it over there. When it comes down to quantifying those into dollars, they struggle and, and that's, not, that's not as easy. And so let's talk about, if you, the two of you can tell me a little bit about some of the mechanics, the how. Um, and what I mean by that is, is it as easy as two potential founders come and see a law firm for like a counseling session, like otherwise married couples would do? Or is it more common or favorable for each to get their own counsel and get counseled independently? Um, how do we help some of these early stage entrepreneurs with the how of, of, of answering some of these questions if they can't do that on their own? It, it, it's a, it, it's, those are great questions. TM, do you want, or TM? Derek, you want to take a first crack at it? Or you want me to take a first crack at yeah, some of those? I could, Let's I unpack could. some of those things. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I can't think of too many mediation sessions I've had <laughs> to negotiate the ownership just because it really ends up being a business decision. It's, it, it ends up being that negotiation between the two of them. Um, I haven't seen instances where both lawyer up, you know, to negotiate that process. That's, that's a possibility, right? If they want to have someone, you know, a, a mediator of some sort, help them negotiate and come to terms. Um, but, but I don't know that it's, it's the norm that it would be necessary to go that route. And so I think from just the business perspective, part of, you know, I guess proving yourself as a business owner and learning the ropes and skills is going to be negotiating and establishing the value, right? You're going to have to do that with clients and customers and, and whoever else that you potential go to. Potential investors. Yeah, and potential investors. So this is, I mean, great first shot at practicing, right? If, if the parties can't come to terms with, <laughs> with what that you know, ownership should look like, and if they choose a third party to help them, you know, great. Um, but ultimately, you know, maybe they need to to figure out some other triggers. Maybe it, maybe we're not talking about just purely equity up front. Hey, you get forty percent, I get sixty percent. But maybe part of it is is and again, these are topics that come up on down the road, equity comp, et cetera. But maybe there's kickers, right? Maybe there's options or something that you know one person's going to put in money early on and so it's very clear what their contribution is going to be so perhaps their percentage you know is 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 more quantifiable and the other perhaps maybe needs to vest um in their shares or maybe needs to receive an option that you know as they as they put in the time yeah one of the things one of the things derek and i see a lot of is when people are um, contributing services versus cash is easy if you can figure out kind of like the valuation of the company or at least you know some kind of um, and we'll get uh, circle back because I think there's some other aspects to your question TM but um, but you know services are always the challenge because usually you're giving folks the ownership up front if you're if you're doing it right you've set up your entity and that's part of the problem TM right like you've set up the entity you have an idea you know, maybe you've completely ideated the idea, um, but you haven't actually started the business yet, right? So there's a lot of chicken and egg, you know, um, kind of stuff. And so 
you know, part of the answer to your question, well, so back to the services thing, part of it is, is that those services haven't been rendered yet, right? Like they haven't been. And so sometimes like what we'll see, and this happens particularly with like the technology stuff, you have that somebody goes and hires a developer, the developer is supposed to help with the MVP, um, you know, and then, you know, they, they go and give them equity. And, you know, six months later, it's, they're three months behind schedule. It's not working the way it's supposed to be working. And now, now now they're in our office, you know what I mean? Like now they're in our office, you know, asking us to review this like agreement <laughs> that they've drafted together <laughs> and ask us what it means. You know what I mean? Like, wh what is this thing we signed and how do I get rid of them? You know what I mean? Like, how do I take back his stock? Like, what do, what do we do? You know, and it's like, well, you, you know, turn back time and uh, come see us six months ago, right? Um, and, and so, you know, those end up being messy. So I think part of the answer to your question is um, in an academically perfect world, it would be great if everyone had their own lawyer and every lawyer understood this and they could all have these like peaceable, you know, discussions. But in my mind, you, you have to at least get a corporate lawyer to help with the company. The, the corporate lawyer can't um, advise you personally, right, TM? So if like you, so now back to, um, let, let's say it's you, Matt and Derek that are starting a business, right? Like, yeah, it'd be great if you all went and got your own lawyers and were advocated for and whatnot. But in reality, that's a lot of law, right? That's a lot of lawyers. It's a lot of expense. Um, to me, it's, you know, like Derek said, it's, it's, it's two, two parts business, one part legal. And legal shouldn't drive the business. The business should inform the legal, right? So there's a little bit of homework folks have to do and um, in figuring out, no, really, how should this company be set up, right? Like we can fit, help with the structure. We can come up with all of the like, okay, and if this doesn't work out, here's a, you know, fail safe. And if this doesn't work out, here's a fail safe, right? Like we can come up with all that stuff. But I think a lot of times founders aren't, um, here's that honest word again, because I don't mean it like they're dishonest, but I don't think they are genuine about what they're contributing, right? Like, because there's always the person who's hubristic and thinks they're amazing. And then there's the other person who's humble and like doesn't want to stand up for themselves and whatnot. And interestingly, that is a big culprit in founder problems. People are just not, you know, just direct and honest <laughs> about what they think they're contributing. They may not be right, you know what I mean? And the other person may disagree, but at least in that discussion, you can come to a um, more mutually acceptable compromise. Like, okay, you know, Melanie thinks she should have 90%. Derek thinks he should have, you know, 90%. Well, we both can't have 90. I mean, I'm not a math whiz, but you can't have 180% of a company, right? So, you know, but like if us both being honest that we think we should be 90%, like, we either walk away from each other because we can never bridge the gap or we, you know, figure out a way. But if we both go into it going, oh, 50, 50, but, you know, we'll figure it out later. Chances are we're setting ourselves up for failure. That was really helpful. Thank you. Um, and by the way, I think I found another uh, topic for a future session. So when does legal drive business? So when does business drive legal? That was a really good analogy of two part business, one part legal. I personally, in my career, have struggled kind of with that at times. And so no, thank you for sharing that. You bet. I was like, our audience is completely silent and I know there's people <laughs> out there. <laughs> yeah, y'all can enter questions we'll just, in the chat as yeah, well. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll keep, we'll, oh, I'm sorry, Matt, I'm talking over you. Like, we'll, we'll just keep on keeping on. I'm, I'm sure our pearls of wisdom are so complete that no one needs any. <laughs> They're, they're so clear. Oh, there's a question. Hey, nice. <laughs> That's a comment. Yeah, uh, I, appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Nathan. <laughs> Try to turn that down so I'm not driving everybody nuts. Oh, is that a, you want to, you want to your no, no, it's a, it's a copy. <laughs> okay, Derek, where'd we leave off? Because we covered some ground. But yeah, we did cover some ground. So I don't know that we've addressed this specific question here regarding shared revenue model and considerations for ownership share versus general employees. And I don't know what the, you know, the specific circumstances are of that question to really address, you know, from a, a specific standpoint. Um, 
Derek, I actually had some questions about that specifically because I was in a shared ownership model where the employees basically own nothing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I guess as I'm working with a new startup, um, it's I'm very sensitive to that situation. Like I don't want to give people a bunch of useless shares and be like, you're owners. Um, so how do we structure the business so people are actually getting something real, but a return on their their work investment? And so I'm just kind of curious um, with the financial structure, what that looks like if we're in a capital. Aaron, what business are you in, if you don't mind me asking? And the, and the reason why I'm asking is because different industries, and I, at the risk of interrupting you, but different, like, yeah. you know, a shared revenue model makes sense when you're in like a service provider, you know, you're in, you're in a, you're in a cash in cash out business, right? Like people are going to, you know, kind of get rid of their cash anyways, by the end of the year. Correct. If you're like in a tech startup or something, a shared revenue model isn't always going to work because a lot of times those companies need to redeploy their capital right back into um, so so what kind of business are you so in i'm in the construction building industry oh, okay. but i think the failure point of the company that i was with before is they were trying to apply a tech model to the building and construction mm -hmm. and those two things just didn't really work out because you need to pay for <laughs> your building materials no. yeah no and I, well i was just gonna say yeah because i mean like when you're in a um a, a lot of equity comp like the true equity comp like in the sense like you know you know options right like giving somebody options or shares in a company or whatever um you know the you know like to your example earlier that works great when a company is, has a planned not, it doesn't have to be planned but like if if on the horizon at some point the company um is going to exit you know giving folks you know options or whatnot um and we'll talk a little bit more about equity comp next time but like that's great because people just get cash right like they get cash on the upside when the company exits right if there's some kind of liquidity or exit um you know the option you know i give you a dollar option you know the strike price is a dollar the company sells for five dollars a share and now you've got four bucks right because you you lose the dollar for your exercise of your option but you netted four and so everyone's happy right because they they're like yay company got sold and i could put a pool in my backyard so they're super excited right um if we <laughs> technically i have ownership in the partnership right but like i mean like like no one's no one's investing in perkins cooey anytime soon right like that's not a thing you know like my ownership only has the value that like my capital account, you know, builds. And so that's why I say like, that's like a different model altogether. Um, but we're also a cash in cash out business. So, you know, if we've got profit to distribute at the end of the year, that's how it gets distributed, right? Like there's, you know, part, you know, merit and part like, oh, you're an owner. So here's your distribution, right? You know what I mean? Here's mm -hmm. your distribution. So if you're in that kind of a business, then, um, you know, that revenue share kind of model, as long as it's not, well, as long as it's not just revenue, it's profit, you know what I mean? Like something yeah. that's extra, right? That doesn't need to go, then that could work out really well. Um, but they could be tricky, right? Um, how you set them up. It could be really simple or it could be um, tricky because it gets complicated. Like who's getting what? And is it based on their merit? Is it based on time there? Um, so I don't know if we've addressed your question at all, Aaron. I'm sorry, Derek, I kind of jumped in on that. Oh, no, that was perfect. Yeah, no, and that, I mean, that gives me some ideas and things to think about too. So thank you. Yeah, did, did, did we, I, I say, okay, were we responsive to your question? Because I don't know if we totally, you know, because to your point, like general employees, like, um, because I don't know if this was your specific question, but, you know, like, who, who are the people in the company, right? Like, you know, they're, I mean, everyone's not equal in a company, right? Like there are very, very, very few organizations that are flat, you know, just completely flat. There is usually some kind of hierarchy in, in um, any kind of a company. And it is completely fair to treat the different levels of the hierarchy differently. You, you know what I mean? Like, I don't mean discriminately, I just mean differently. Like there are people who maybe they've been around for over a decade. I'm just using a decade as an, an example, but you know, they've been around and so maybe they should get more ownership, you know what I mean? Versus someone you just hired who's maybe extremely valuable, but hasn't proven their worth yet, right? Um, but they did a good job. So at the end of the year, give them a cash bonus, 
You know what I mean? Like, you know, you, mm-hmm. you, you, you reward them, you know, for that good stuff. Um, so it's, it's, there could be different tools for, for which class of uh, contributor in your company, you know, you're taught, you're uh, talking about. Oh. Okay. We had another question in the chat. If I can see the chat view. Yeah, let me read it. Uh, read it out loud, Derek. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. This is from Brooke. Regarding accrued capital accounts, what are best practices at divestiture of shares? Does capital account get paid out or is it used to increase bases and in sale? What should partner expectations be? Hey, Brooke, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can field this a little bit. A lot of that's going to be driven, honestly, by your operating agreement and, and what it says. Um, you know, how, how, how folks are going to get treated at divestiture. Um, you know, some companies, um, and, I, and I'm guessing you mean divestiture. I don't know if you mean like exit of a company or just like buyout of a partner, um, because th- those also can be handled differently. You know what I mean? And, and could be circumscribed in an operating agreement, which, you know, if you're like an LLC, for example, that's going to absolutely drive, um, the decision, you know what I mean? That's gonna, that's usually gonna be the roadmap. Um, I'm not sure if I totally understand the capital account getting paid or used to increase basis and in sale. I'm not sure if I totally understand that question. I would also encourage uh, Brooke to, to join us audio or video wise so we can maybe elaborate on the question. That's an option too. Yeah. While we're kind of figuring that out there, should we kind of keep on keeping on? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this next question here was related to um, convertible debt. And again, if the person who asked that question wants to jump in, great. We're happy to get more context. But in terms of convertible debt, I'm, I'm guessing what you're asking is in relation to, you know, you've already founded the company, you've split up ownership amongst the founders, and now you're you're getting capital, right? Rather that's from an investor, whether that's from yourself, as we mentioned in an earlier scenario where you're, you're putting in some additional dollars. And as Melanie said, it's, it's equity or debt, right? So in terms of you know, looking at convertible debt, one thing to keep in mind as you're, you're issuing convertible debt is that the ownership you, percentage right, that you have now, so if you have 75% your co-founder has 25% and now you're bringing in convertible debt. That convertible debt, once it converts, is ultimately going to reduce the percentage that you have. And a couple things to keep in mind um, with this convertible debt is that oftentimes you'll see terms in that debt that, that treats it a little bit um, favorably on a conversion. So you might give uh, that convertible debt a discount, right? So the idea is that the convertible debt will convert in your next equity financing. Let's say you're raising a series seed financing and the series seed financing is for a dollar per share. That convertible debt might have a discount of, you know, 20%, right? So when that note converts, it's converting at 80 cents per share versus a dollar per share. Um, You also have to consider that that convertible debt is accruing interest. And unless you're going to pay that interest out in cash, um, that interest is also converting. And so as you as you issue convertible debt, what you want to keep in mind and try to model out where you can is what um, additional dilution that is going to have on your ownership, you know, based on the terms, whether you're giving a discount, you know, based on the interest rate, et cetera. And so that's, that's a future event. You can model for it. You can try and understand, you know, what impact the terms of that debt is going to have on your ownership. Um, but other than, than considering those factors, um, I don't know that it, it necessarily drives how you're 
you're dividing the pie in the beginning, right? If you're if you're just starting out and issuing shares to the founders. Melanie, anything to add on that? No, not really. I, I no, you handled that well. I, I was the only thing I was gonna more add is that separate but related is a lot of times Derek and I will inherit a company that, you know, I don't know, just started somewhere else or didn't have a lawyer or who knows. And a lot of folks don't, we, we prefer to see that there's convertible debt on the cap table. I mean, you might not have a percentage next to it, but we, we want to see that it exists. And a lot of times folks won't have it on the cap table, right? So we'll, you know, or like a sheet, right? Like imagine your cap table being an Excel spreadsheet, right? Like, you know, we like to have like the cap table and then like a separate sheet that's like, hey, look, by the way, here's here's these various folks that invested or, or, or you know, lent money under a convertible note. Because to Derek's point, um, you, you don't know what it looks like today unless it has the ability to convert today, in which case then you can, you know, model in here's what it would look like today if it converted. Um, but, but you want to have it out there um, for a whole host of reasons, because it's good to know um, what it could, what impact it could have down the road. Yeah. Similarly with safes, right? Mm -hmm. Simple agreements. Safes, warrants, all yeah. of that stuff. Yep. Yeah. So you want to just make sure that that's Your equity tracking. comp plan. I mean, yep. every day people just want to see all the possible, um, particularly if you're propping yourself for, for investment or you have like, you know, anyone coming in, um, people want to understand how their situation can change in the future. And they want to understand the various folks that have a right to change that. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Matt, if you want to hit the next slide. All right, so the 10% issue. <laughs> the Facebook so, issue. <laughs> Melanie, do you want to kick this one off? Oh, you're, you're giving me all the fun stuff, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of our favorite ones and people like never learn this lesson. Um, people always talk about uh, percentages of companies, right? Like they're always like, oh, I'm gonna give Matt, you know, I'll give Matt 20 and TM 10 and, you know, like whatever been, because, you know, I, I know TM, I, I mean, you know. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> and, you know, and they write up this stuff and, you know, they send each other emails, you know, oh, Derek, you're so great. I can't wait for you to come on board. We're going to give you 10% of the company. And, you know, Derek's like, oh, great. That's awesome. I, I can't start until August 1st. And we're like, oh, that's cool. Who cares? You know, like when you start, it's going to be great. And so in between today and August 1st, you know, my company goes and does a fundraise, right? And now we've brought on a new investor. Everyone who's currently at the company has been diluted. Um, has Derek been diluted? I mean, he doesn't start until August 1st. So does he get his 10% on August 1st? Or did he get his 10% today, which is now worth, I don't know, I'm just making something up, 8%. Because if, it, if he got diluted the way everybody else did, you know, he would have suffered, you know, I don't know, 20% dilution because we just let an investor in who took 20% of the company. And so he should have gone from 10 to eight, um, like everybody else. Um, and so one of the, so there's a few issues that happen. And, we, and, 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 and there is like, unfortunately, lots of case law out there <laughs> because this happens all the time. The issue is not that you said, I'm going to give you 10%. The issue is, is that you didn't say, you know, 10% today and based on, you know, fully diluted, not fully diluted, like what are all the magic words, right? Because, you know, is it based on full dilution? Like meaning it's 10% inclusive of all those things we just talked about, warrants, convertible debt, equity plans, you know, whatever else is on there that people have a right. Um, is it just... 10% based on who owns it today, putting aside, you know, the equity plan and all these other things. So we like to encourage folks. And, and so anyways, there's been, there's been people out there who at the founding stage, you know, who knows, propped up a website, helped with some early stage development, you know, did some things that were, you know, critical to the company. But five years later, when the company exits and they had never gotten their paper and they walk in with their, you know, email <laughs> that says, hey, the company was supposed to give me 10%. And now it's five years later. And that 10% is, 
you know, at founding was worth, you know, just let's make up a number, a hundred thousand, you know, but now the company's about to sell for, you know, a hundred million. Is that person entitled to 10 million? You know what I mean? What does that look like? Um, and by the way, the email was probably a contract. So good luck. <laughs> good luck saying, oh, we didn't mean to give them 10 million five years from now. <laughs> so the thing is, is that it, it's a big problem in early stage. Like people don't want to talk to lawyers. They don't want to get this stuff drafted. And of course they all understood what they meant, right? Um, they all meant 10%, but you know, timing and exactly what 10% could be really costly in the future. Yeah, and this this frequently comes up. We're asked to do diligence, right, for investors looking at early stage companies to invest in all the time. Um, we have new clients that come and have started, right, and kind of handled their own stuff and are now lawyering up because they're about to have investors invest. And it it you know, without fail, it becomes a question, you know, that we raise to the investors say, hey, look, it, it says 10%, right? There's, there's nothing that indicates that that 10% should change, that it's dilutive, et cetera. And so for clarity's sake, I mean, speak in terms of shares, right? Or mm -hmm. units, because they're, you're then giving them, you know, a specific number that as the pie grows, and the total number of outstanding shares or units change, then their percentage, you know, just shifts with it. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's, it's so much easier to avoid the confusion, the hassle, the cost that comes later by just being, being very clear about what that person is actually receiving. And Derek, you know, we've seen, you know, there's a hybrid approach to this, right? Like there's lots of folks that you may hire and they want to have, uh, you know, guaranteed 3% post series A, right? You know, they're like, hey, I'm coming in as your CFO and I want to ensure that, you know, until we become middle stage or something like that, right, that I have 3%. And so the key is not to be like, oh, you have 3%, you know, the, the key is to be like, okay, here's the amount of shares you get now. And then you create an agreement where they get grossed up. You know what I mean? The person just gets grossed up and we see that all the time. It's a real thing. Um, and there's ways to do it. And, you know, if you use options, there's ways to do it in a tax-free fashion. Um, so you can achieve that if that's what's intended. But again, Derek's, to Derek's point, like, let's make it crystal clear <laughs> that that's the scenario, right? Make it crystal clear that, yeah, we did mean for John Smith to have, you know, 3% post A, but we didn't mean it to be 3% ad infinitum forever, right? You know, um, and so you just, you know, there, there, there's ways to carve it up, but be clear, um, you know, really, you know, the, what, what was the meeting of the minds, as we say, you know, what yeah. was the actual meeting of the minds? So is the rule, this is Brock guys, is the rule of thumb not to talk about percentages and talk specifically about the number of shares? Brock, Brock. It's, a, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I think people talk in percentages today, right? So like if you're going to go hire someone, you know, you're going to go look at comp tables, they're going to look at comp tables, and she may come forward and say, hey, you're hiring me as your CFO, and, you know, market is 3%, and you'll go, oh, okay, I'm cool with that, that's great but then translate it into a document that says that's 10,000 shares. You know what I mean? Like A, yeah. translate it into a document. Like 100% don't leave your little email hanging out there and let that be the writing. Because rest assured, she will come forward with that in litigation and be like, Brock promised me 3%. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because um, that will be your agreement. Second, when you get to that memorialization stage, talk in numbers of shares for sure. And it's okay to talk in, I mean, we'd prefer people talk in numbers of shares from the onset, but we get that percentage is important, right? Right, and it's, it's easy to say, you know, here's your 100,000 shares, right? Which is the equivalent of whatever percent you agree to, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the equivalent of 3% as of the date of this agreement, right? So it's just being clear that, that that's going, it's susceptible to change. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Well, and no, here's what will really happen. They'll, they'll go look at your cap table and they'll see how the rest of your uh, team is compensated right. and they'll want one share more. <laughs> right. I mean, one, I, this, my next, my question kind of goes back to the previous conversation, which is how do you divide the pie up initially? 
if you're going to go for kind of high growth mode, I'm going to raise a handful of different rounds and I'm going to go exit seven years from now. And you're going to do five rounds of financing and priced rounds. Each time you're doing that, you're adding, a, you know, 10 or 20% in the terms of an ESOP, mm -hmm. right? So in addition mm -hmm. to the dilution that takes place from an investment standpoint, you're adding in that 10 to 20% ESOP. Um, I have to imagine over time, although I've never done the complicated math, that if you have a founder that's coming in, like a co-founder that's coming in at 30%, and that individual sees the writing on the wall from a dilution standpoint, you need to be having active dialogue across all your employees, particularly those, those founders around the notion that each, each time that a new ESOP is opened up, they're going to get a significant chunk of that ESOP. And it's the percentage conversation is a constantly moving number. And they no, to, Brock, not, you're making a really, you're making a really good um, point that I, that is lost on a lot of our clients. And Derek and I have actually had these conversations recently with folks, right? Like, Today we're talking about, you know, we're actually talking about a lot of stuff. This is covering a, a, a bit more of the topics than just the founder pie. But the founder pie isn't like one bullet and one and done. And, and Brock, I think you're raising a really good point that as, you know, you go into the future, there's other opportunities to continue to incentivize your team, your founders, um, whatnot. Like you don't just have one bullet in the gun. And if people are contributing, you know, they could not just get diluted over time, but you could, you know, continue to give them, you know, options and things like that. And you raise a great point about the continued rounds of financing. I mean, you know, <laughs> for any of the VC, if there's any VCs on the phone, I mean, on one hand, they want your guys to be incentivized. On the other hand, every time they ask you to increase that plan at a raise, it actually gives them an, a better effective purchasing price because it's allowing them to buy more for less. So yep. don't get confused that they're being benevolent to their employees <laughs> all the time. They're going to push for 20% over 5% because it gives them more. And they're going to tell you, you got to hire and you got to grow and it's going to be important to have shares available and blah, blah, blah. I mean, there's a whole narrative that goes with it. But the reality is that it also benefits to do that. Um, very rarely are they like, oh, I want it to be 20 and let's do it post-closing. <laughs> Right. <laughs> they're like, I want it to be 20 and it needs to be done at closing because they're going to put that in the denominator. Right. And so their, per their share price is going to go down, which means they get to buy more shares. And you're going to be like, oh, they care about my employees. This is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> they're so awesome. We love these guys. They're going to be great partners. Can you explain the phenomenon of the one year cliff and how that applies to employee stock options like specifically Aaron we absolutely can but you're going to have to come back next month because this is going to be part of all of <laughs> oh, next month yeah okay. next yep. month is all equity comp so hopefully hopefully you'll be able to come back but the one year cliff and then the prorated think of it as kind of like a probation i mean a lot of times well what it's really intended to do is you know hey let's get people to hang around for enough time that we know that they're a long timer not a short timer and then we'll start vesting it and it's it's an interesting concept because so now let's imagine your employee that's been there for 4 years and you're giving them a second or third you know, do you still have the cliff? Do you not have the cliff? That's just part of the plan. If they've been given op options earlier, does it matter? Um, but at a very super high level, that's kind of the mechanic. So I don't know if I'm answering your, your specific question, Aaron, but the mechanic of the cliff is nothing happens for some period of time to ensure that that person's, you know, like otherwise you get like a month or two of vesting and the person didn't work out and you're like, oh God, now we've got this person on the cap table. What do we do with them? And, um, you've, gone, and you've gone through the expense of training and hiring and everything else, right? Yeah. Well, guys, we're coming close to the top of the hour and you guys have had some amazing questions, but like we are certainly available to answer others. Like Derek said at you know, the beginning of this, like the whole, hopefully you guys are enjoying the program. I mean, the whole, we, and we don't want to be weird about like, oh, this is the topic today. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but, you know, the whole point of this is to create this forum where you could ask these questions in a, in a safe space. <laughs> <laughs> there are no dumb questions. Only people who don't ask them and then end up getting bitten because they didn't ask it. <laughs>
Um, this is Kelsey J. I have a question for you guys. If you can give an example of a conversation you've had with founders that are friends that are starting a business together. This happens a lot in my practice, like super sweet people. They're like best friends. They love each other. They've got this big idea and nothing in the world can bring them down. And so I spend a lot of time coaching them on all the what ifs of what could go wrong. Kelsey, so, what do you, what do you do? Um, I have a solo practice and I focus, it's business law. A lot of it focuses on social mm -hmm. entrepreneurship. Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty niche little practice, lots of collaborative and cooperative mm -hmm. concepts packed in there. So my clients tend to be um, very like emotionally intelligent people. <laughs> so I do a lot of emotional counseling with them through the lens of helping them set up and manage their businesses. So it's super fulfilling. Um, but it can also be really sad sometimes when I watch the what ifs that I warned them about happen and they didn't prep for it. Derek, so I can't remember how far into the future our um, uh, buy sell agreement one. So you're bringing So Kelsey, if you're along for the ride and you you come in the future, you're probably going to hear this twice. But you're gonna you're gonna make me roll out my trite. Um, here, here's what I always say to people. I'm always like especially if I'm giving a presentation in a room, right? I'm always like, hey, can anyone tell me how many people, um, how many marriages end in divorce, right? And, and everyone's like, oh, I know the answer. It's, you know, uh, you know, half, 60%, 40%, right? Like everyone kind of, you know, gives a number around there. And I'm like, okay, well, how many business partnerships then do you think succeed? And you just see the light bulb go off, right? Like people are just like, oh, wait. I'm going to guess that's like not as good of a statistic, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and I think that the point, you know, so I was like, I often use that Kelsey and I, and I try to, you know, talk to folks because I think that, you know, to Derek's point earlier, you're talking about dividing the pie, but you also have to consider at the same time, dividing it up in the future, right? Like meaning a prenup in a way, you know what I mean? Like what, here, here's how we're gonna divide it up because we think this is how it's gonna work, but here's our roadmap for unwinding it or getting somebody out or buying them out or, or whatever. Um, and, and we find, I don't know if this is completely, you know, helping you or with your actual question, but we find that, that helping people go through that exercise early you know what I mean, forces some uncomfortable conversations that are way easier to have now when you're talking in theory versus in the future. I mean, Derek and I were, we were tempted to have one of our clients be part of this, but we thought it might be a little too close to home for them. But Derek and I worked for, gosh, Derek, how long? Almost two years yeah. with a client that was a family that went into business together and unfortunately, like aren't even on speaking terms now. And it just was, I mean, and it went through like business mediation and, you know, like legal mediation and ultimately, you know, it ended up with a, with a buyout. Um, but it was very, very difficult um, in part because it was family, which that's just never fun. Right. Um, and in part because that roadmap wasn't there, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and that was um, challenging. Yeah. And, and, and the difficult thing is, right, you can't force someone's hand to make these decisions, right? As, as, as lawyers, we're here to advise, right? We share about the risk. We help provide some solutions to help navigate that risk mm -hmm. um, if they're willing to accept those solutions. But, you know, if they're not, it's, it's just ultimately their decision. They've accepted the risk, right? And so I had it with the, you know, I saw it with a startup client years ago where it was a boyfriend and a girlfriend mm. and you know they were they did you know pretty much a 50 50 split you know life was good they were happy they were living together and within just a few weeks um that relationship just went south um yeah if you think it's hard buying a dog together yeah <laughs> wait till it, you start dividing up a business when you don't yeah. like each other anymore so then you've got a a, a boyfriend that's exiting but has this large percentage of the company and no way to, you know, not, not forced to give it back, right. Or to sell it back. And so, yeah, the, it, it can turn into some ugly scenarios, but um, that's, you know, our, our job is to help coach and guide and, you know, advise of risk. And then ultimately the decision maker gets to assume whatever risk they would, they would, they're happy with. Right.
Mm -hmm. It's Tiffany. There's another uh, question in the chat. It's from uh, Ernest and it says, what do you recommend for preview businesses? Oh, pre-rev. Pre um, Thank you. Yeah, no, no, no problem. No problem, Ernest. Um, for pre-rev businesses, I mean, all of the above of what we discussed. And that's, that's the big challenge, Ernest, is when you're in a pre-rev company, um, and it's hard for you to figure out what the value is of the company. Um, I don't know, it's, it's facts and circumstances. Um, you know, what, what, what is that contribution? Who, who's the one who's forming the company? Who's the one that's not? I mean, if Derek and I are coming together at the same time with a joint, you know, shared idea, it's, it's a little bit easier to be like, oh, it, it should be pretty pro rata. Again, not maybe 50, 50, but 51, 49, or, you know, 60, 40, or something that reflects that there's somebody at the helm, but the other person is pretty close behind, right? Um, you know, so, so in a pre rev company, that, you know, just really becomes those kinds of discussions. And a lot of times it's not a problem that things are pro rata. The problem is people don't contribute exactly the same amount at exactly the same amount of time at the exact same time. And so for us, the bigger issue isn't that it's pro rata, but that like everyone got, you know, 33, 33 and 34%, but, you know, one person put cash in that first day and the other person was supposed to develop something and they never did. And so now you're stuck with this person who's got a third of the company, but their contribution wasn't what the company thought the contribution should be. So what do you do with that person, right? So hopefully at the onset, you crafted it in a way that it's like, hey, you're going to get a third, but you're going to earn it. You're going to earn it and these metrics have to be met. And if you meet those metrics, then you get it. And Ernest, if that, I hope that answered your question. If not, feel free to enter some chat. I know you were having some issues with audio that I was um, privately chatting with you about, um, but thank you for that question. Metrics, I love it. Good. <laughs> but it's really hard. I mean, you know, I know we're at the top of the hour, but it's really difficult. That's the hardest part is people just, again, that goes back to the point I made to TM, right, is that people are just not honest about their contributions, right? And, you know, you just got to hold people's feet to the fire. I mean, if you want somebody to develop something for you and you have a scope of work, then tie the metrics to that scope of work. If it's a CFO, maybe it's more time, right? Maybe it makes more sense to be like, hey, as long as you stick around for a year or two, we're good. Because as long as they're doing their job. But when somebody's making something for you, it doesn't matter how long they've been around. If they don't make it, yeah. <laughs> why would they get their shares? Yeah. This was a really good session, you guys. Thanks, Tim. Thanks. Very informative. Yeah, I was looking forward to this one. And um, yeah, pulled a lot from it. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for everyone. And thank you, Kelsey. Um, good to hear you. Um, thank you, Aaron, as well. Those were some great questions. Um, and thanks for joining. Um, if there's if there's any other questions, feel free to unmute yourself or um, uh, mention in the chat. Otherwise, um, I did want to point out um, the next coffee clutch I have on the slide here. Um, the 30th at nine talking about equity compensation. So Aaron, do come back for that. Um, I will be emailing everyone on this call and that is registered a recording of today's session as well as um, a link for the to register for the next one. Um, so yeah, with that, thank you so much for everyone. Um, feel free to stick around if you have any last minute questions and look forward to seeing y'all uh, next next month. Thanks all. Thanks everybody. We appreciate you. <laughs>